my passion for leather really comes from my original place as a designer in the industry. As an artist, sometimes it's pencils or, or color. Leather is my medium in that sense. And so the opportunity for me to take it a little further is that I get to build things out of it. I have a very three-dimensional creation. We so often look at something that's overly engineered and there's a, a chilliness, a coldness about it that never happens with a piece of leather. The, the natural, intrinsic nature of the material is always coming through to you. And at the point at which maybe you overprocess it and that's lost, that's the point at which the material is no longer interesting. Where can you find something that has that flexibility, that pliability, and yet that strength? It can be made waterproof, it can be made purposely to permeate with water, it can really create uh, the characteristics that you need in so many different products. And Mother Nature does that better than anyone. All of our land is already degraded. You can kill the soil with a plow just as easy as you can with a chemical. Something has changed. 80% of all fabric and textiles hit landfill. We need to understand nature because we've forgotten. Holistic management opened up a huge door for us. The way of managing how long animals are in one place and when they return to it. My animals are my tool to make it grow, to make photosynthesis go. The mortality rates decreased and people started living in peace. It's not for my betterment, it's for our betterment. Everything we do has an origin and an impact. We can create a beautiful and just world that we want to live in. If you had to bring it all down to one thing, it would just be that management needs to become holistic. It's one of the the big four. If you think about the, the, the things that drive life, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, in our industry it's cotton, wool, silk, and leather. For hundreds of years leather had use in every aspect of our life. It was readily available because everyone lived on a farm. Uh, it wasn't about making a fancy handbag or a really nice pair of shoes. It was about making a pair of shoes, but they were about covering your feet. So we went from a, a point in history where leather was very localized, the way you'd buy flour or sugar, to an industrialization, to people not wanting it in their cities, to uh, a growing population needing more and more of it. Leather is used in so many aspects of our life open your car door and sit down on your leather seat. Uh, hop a plane to visit your grandmother and you're sitting on a piece of leather. Uh, the furniture industry is one of the largest users of leather. So leather is really still everywhere in our lives. Uh, and in many cases, it's been industrialized to an enormous level. Where the consumer is going is wanting something that is more authentic, that is much more unique, and where there's greater transparency and technology allows us to meet the consumer on all those fronts by giving them the opportunity through our website to design their perfect handbags, choosing the leathers and the colors that they want to use in designing a bag that is unique to them. The millennials who are just moving into a place where they have the disposable income to make discretionary purchases, they're all about this. They're all about co-creation. They're all about value. They're all about not buying brands for the sake of brands, but rather buying product that is a better sort of signature representation of who they are. We don't sit on a warehouse full of finished goods that we've already pre-produced with the hope that someone will buy them. And having all come from the retail industry, myself and my two colleagues, we have deep experience in the fact that the one thing you know about your forecast is it's never right. So inevitably there's product in the warehouse that just won't get sold and gets marked down multiple times and often gets shipped offshore to a jobber and ultimately in a landfill. It's all about having a much greater view into what the process is that brought the product to their hands. So this notion of co-creation, this notion of being um, part of the story or of even being able to tell my story and using a product as a vehicle to do that. In my lifetime, the, the change in the industry has been absolutely dramatic. I mean, I started here basically straight out of college in, in 1978. There were 250 tanneries in the United States. And now, depending upon how you classify us, there may be 20, 25. 
the single largest segment for us is sporting goods. You know, we do the leather for Wilson for the NFL and for Spalding for the NBA and for Rawlings for their pro model gloves. And so that's a big piece of the business. The second major segment is shoes for people like Alden and Allen Edmonds here, Crockett and Jones and churches in England and you know some of the really fine shoemakers. They're true crafts people sort of really doing things the old-fashioned way because they also haven't found something better. You know leather in the final analysis is a very tactile interaction. You, know, you, you see a piece of leather made into a product or if you're going to make something you're buying the leather because you have a vision of the product and the expectation of what it should feel like you maybe unconsciously form. And if it doesn't match up, then you're probably not going to use it. So, you know, we want it to be something that feels great and feels very rich. And also something that our, that the, our ultimate boss, of course, who's the consumer, goes, you know, I've had these for X amount of time, and they look amazing. So I'm, I'm coming back and getting a pair of these. The traceability in terms of knowing where the heights come from is something that's going to, I would guess, improve dramatically sooner rather than later, and I would say certainly within the next five years, we'll, we'll have it down really precisely. Some places that can be done now, I mean, I can tell you, we, I'm, we mark our hides when we receive them, so I can tell you who we got them from so I can get you back to the whatever packing house it came from. We don't yet have full the full capabilities of taking it all the way back to the farm, but I think that that's coming. There's a real breakdown, a real siloing of our industry when it comes from the full spectrum of agriculture to the consumer. Even in the middle, from the designer's perspective or from the perspective of a, of a company, a brand, there is almost no understanding, no vision to the back end or the origin end of the leather supply chain. A designer or a design team will spec using a certain material from a certain tannery that they've met at a leather show or that they've met through a representative agency and that is all they ever know uh, from the consumer and unfortunately it's even less transparent. Leather doesn't come as a main ingredient. Leather comes as a byproduct of the beef industry and so we don't have the same controls. We don't have the same opportunity to direct everything down to the supplier level. But we drive some of the biggest profit margins as a byproduct. Leather is expensive. Good leather is really expensive. And I think there's an opportunity for us to, to leverage that, to engage the business that we bring to the sector and have a little bit more of a direct impact all the way back to the agriculture. Pricewaterhouse Cooper developed with Caring, parent company of many big apparel brands, this approach to trying to take full cost accounting, natural capital accounting, um, into their supply chain decisions. Starting with raw material production on the ground and going into the processing and manufacturing. The first case determined that raw material production was a huge hotspot, especially leather. That was where most of their impacts were coming from, not the manufacturing, not the um, processing of it, not the sales or the distribution, but it was, it was in that production process and it really helped them to, um, I think, guide their decisions and the focus that they wanted to have. The longer your supply chain gets, the more difficult it is to ensure what you're getting. You really only interact with the link directly before you. And so that is the difficulty, I think, and that's why some of these brands are going back to the producers and hoping that if they form an agreement that all of those other steps, the manufacturing, the processing, all, all the other steps kind of have to follow suit. And it's just, it's, it is really hard. If you're buying leather from an Italian leather manufacturer who promises you that it's from Europe, but it's actually from Brazil, it's really hard to tell. The consumer drives the finances. The consumer says yes or no. As the consumer increasingly cares about transparency, cares about a system that is a closed loop, they'll start to expect it, they'll start to demand it. That works its way straight back to the agriculture, straight back to the animal in the way we treat the lands that the animals are grazing on, in the way we process the animals and their hides. That rising consciousness and their understanding and demand for transparency will transform our business.
Whether or not you believe in climate change or humans blame for climate change, fact of the matter is there's more carbon in the atmosphere now than we should have. And the best opportunity that we've got to put it back into the soil is through photosynthesis. And that's where the cow becomes king because the cow is the perfect tool to use to stimulate these plants to pump more sugar down. So Surprise Valley is on the westernmost side of the Great Basin on the California-Nevada border. Predominantly sagebrush steppe with uh, um, some sub-irrigated meadows in the, in the base of it. Some struggles that we have are a really short growing season. So one of the benefits to that is it's really conducive to animal agriculture. The family ranchers, the large scale ranchers, the people that are on the ground day to day do it because they love it. I truly don't believe that there is anybody that's got malice of heart and is trying to do things wrong or incorrectly or that would have negative implications to their land based business. We need to offer them the tools to make those decisions and give them the knowledge base on how these ecosystems function and how their actions can either enhance or, or not. The current state of affairs on our landscape isn't because animals don't eat grass. It's because how we manage those animals with the grassland. You really need to be utilizing a planned grazing system to where you are managing where those cattle have access to grass, what stage is that grass in, so that we can pump more carbon into the soil and create that, that dynamic soil profile that'll catch the water and, and you know have more biological activity in it. So plants breathe in carbon dioxide, and then they take that carbon and they put it into their, their cells, into their material. So they're taking up that carbon and they're, they're making sugars out of it, right? So everything that a plant becomes is that carbon dioxide. So the carbon becomes part of the plant, and then it also becomes part of what the plant exchanges with. So if it's in the leaf, it, it might be respired back to the atmosphere, but if it's in the roots, it might get taken hold of by fungi or by bacteria or by anything else that's living in the soil that can mineralize it. The power of, of soil is really just that it has all these ingredients that not just for, for the vegetation and, and productivity, but for um, sequestering carbon, for in allowing water to infiltrate, for capturing water so that floods aren't quite so bad. In grasslands, you really are constructing um, the potential for an ecosystem to function exactly as it did ever before humans were there, um, and yet manage it in a way that allows us to make a living off it, which is really like such a win for nature. The consumer is really looking for a product that, that they can relate to. And there are a lot of producers out, here, out there that are doing a really good job of, of improving the land base. And I think that, that if that story can be told, the consumer will use their purchasing power to grab a hold of that and really propel that movement forward. Consumers right now could call me and source meat or leather from somebody that we have certified as regenerative. Since we are a zero waste farm, we utilize the entire animal. Uh, the, the cow is born on our farm, the cow is then slaughtered on our farm, packaged, shipped, all from, all from the, um, this one farm. So uh, utilizing every part of that animal from the meat to the bones to the fat, uh, even to the hide. Most customers uh, that would uh, be interested in buying leather, uh, you know, they either don't care or uh, they just don't know where their leather's coming from. Uh, you know, they, they can sit in their car and not know or not care uh, where that seat was made. Um, they can buy their, their dog collar at a, a really boutique pet store, but, uh, you know, not be interested in where that leather came from. Uh, but then they can go to Whole Foods and be really passionate about the food that they're putting in their mouth. It has to happen. Otherwise, the raw material will go away. We'll get to a point where we simply don't have it. Part of sustainability is actually sustaining the opportunity for that craft, for that material, for that artisanship. And if we don't change the process, if we don't develop that line of transparency, we're gonna find ourselves without proper materials. And that the industry is not gonna let happen. We're all citizens of the world. And so, you know, really only wanna deal with people that are handling themselves responsibly. I don't want the animals abused or come from lands that shouldn't be used for the process. There's no profit number that I could 
get off of that that would make me feel good enough about it to do it. Consumers absolutely have a voice and need to show that it matters to them. I mean, what do we want to do? Is the goal for humanity to survive? I totally believe we can. I believe that we are smart enough to figure out ways that we can still divert the, the emergency trajectory that we're on right now and make it a little less catastrophic. If the question is, are we going to be able to keep everything exactly the same as it ever was? Probably not. But I think that we can create a beautiful and just world that we want to live in. And I think that's what we're trying for. Nothing moves faster than fashion. We produce six collections a year. We're swapping out a store every month and a half. We are this giant ship that turns like a go-kart. And so the opportunity for us is thrilling for transparency in the leather industry. If our industry decides to do this, and I truly believe we're on the precipice of making that decision, it will happen faster than energy, faster than food, faster than any other sector. And at two and a half trillion dollars, with one in six people in the world working in our industry in some direct or indirect way, it has the opportunity to have the greatest impact of any of the businesses.